Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Brian. I'm a game developer and graphics programmer. Um, I was co-founder of Muse Games, where I was lead game designer on a game you might have heard of, Guns of Icarus Online. Uh, after that, I spent a couple years working on mobile games and experiences at SIOP New York. Um, but today, I'm going to talk about some work I did last year with us, too, in New York uh, on two VR projects, which I'm sure you've heard of, Cardboard Design Lab and Arctic Journey. So what I really want to talk about is how vertex displacement, a feature in the Cardboard SDK, was developed for the needs of both those projects and how it can help you develop performant VR experiences. So the first project was Cardboard Design Lab. Uh, it was released early last year. Hopefully, you've all tried it out. Uh, if you haven't, I highly recommend getting it. It's also open source, so you can, in addition to testing it out, you can mess around with it, get it to build on other platforms, anything you want. Um, but the primary purpose of Design Lab is to showcase best practices in VR for cardboard developers, as well as some activities best avoided. Uh, but beyond just the principles, it was important that the experience also be beautiful and, of course, run smoothly at 60 frames per second. We wanted Design Lab to embody what a cardboard experience could and should be. But at the same time, we really wanted to push the limits of what's possible on a mobile device. We wanted to create lush visuals and have high performance at the same time. So we set an ambitious goal for ourselves. Let's see if we can achieve this look while still hitting 60 frames per second on a Nexus 5 and maybe throw in anti-aliasing and some dynamic lights. Uh, but we ran into problems. Almost immediately, we realized this was going to be really challenging. Older devices were struggling to hit 30 frames per second on even simple test scenes. They were overheating. So during the development of Design Lab, we experimented with a new method of distortion correction called vertex displacement. Uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. But I just want to sort of put this in context first. Without vertex displacement, most of what you see in Design Lab would not have been possible. Uh, but then we didn't stop there. So fast forward six months, and we worked on a second project. And that's Arctic Journey, which is the demo project in the, or the demo scene in the Cardboard app. Uh, and this time, we wanted to push it even further, adding more animated characters, richer lighting, uh, and a more dynamic environment. And this project gave us you know, one of those rare chances to reflect on the lessons we'd learned before while working on Design Lab and refine our workflow. So we set an even more ambitious goal. Let's see if we can do the same thing, but this time make it richer and run on older devices. Uh, we knew anti-aliasing on old phones was almost impossible, uh, but maybe we could get them to at least run at 60. So in this case, we were targeting the S3, the iPhone 5, the S4. And if you've worked with any of these devices, uh, they're really challenging, especially for cardboard apps. So I've sort of broken this talk into two parts that mirror the evolution of our workflow on these two projects. Uh, and first, I'm going to talk about you know, what is vertex displacement, how do you use it, how can it help you? Uh, and second, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step back and go a bit more broad. How can you take advantage of some of these lessons to further optimize performance in other ways? Uh, so first, let's talk about vertex displacement. But to do that, we need to really quickly talk about how VR rendering works. So here's a cardboard application. Uh, on your device, you render the left and right eye out on your smartphone. And then you pick up your cardboard, and you look at them through the lenses. And these lenses are what create the wide field of view. But because, as with any lenses, they warp the image, if you render out this cardboard icon the way you see it and look through the cardboard, you'll see an image that's distorted. So instead, we render with the inverse of that lens distortion applied. And this happens in our application through the Cardboard SDK, typically either in a post-process image effect or by rendering to a texture and projecting that texture onto a warped mesh and then re-rendering the screen. So now when we look through the lenses, the distortion cancels out and we see the correct image. It's a fairly simple process, but as graphics programmers in the room know, full screen render textures are not free, uh, especially on older devices, Devices with dense screens, low power devices, these full screen render textures can create serious performance problems. So what we wanted to do was cut this out and render directly to the screen buffer instead. But we needed a way to apply the lens distortion before rendering. So what if instead of warping the rendered image, we just warp the geometry before we finish rendering? Maybe in a vertex shader, like that. And this is what it actually looks like. Um, so this is the optical distortion correction being applied in the vertex shader, uh, animated here for effect. Uh, 
So instead of transforming individual pixels uh, from the rendered image, we bent the actual world and then just render normally. So we no longer need our render texture. I, I think this is pretty awesome. Um, you can see in this wireframe image, as vertices extend outward from the center of the screen, they're affected more, just like a Photoshop lens correction effect. Uh, this is extremely efficient, especially on older, lower power devices. This can represent a large increase in performance. On the S3, this, this doubled performance. Uh, on newer devices, you'll see less of an impact. I think on the 5S, the iPhone, uh, it was 20 to 30% increase in performance. OK, so this is great. Uh, but there are some drawbacks. Mostly because this method only operates on vertices, you can see lines between vertices always remain straight. So the quality of this effect is dependent on both the distance from the camera as well as the vertex density of the scene. So you might wonder, how many vertices do we need? Uh, and I've put two foxes here. And one of these images is rendered using the new technique, vertex displacement. Uh, and the other is rendered using a rendered texture at double resolution. Um, both are just using simple Lambertian diffuse n.l. And they're almost identical. So you might say, like, OK, well, how, how dense is this mesh? And the answer is it's not that dense. So we don't need too much. Uh, and here's, I don't know if you can see this. It's a little tough to see. This is an error image between the post process and the vertex displacement. Uh, and it, it looks pretty good. Um, so you might wonder, OK, this is great. How low can we go? Like, what about a quad? OK, and so a quad is the, the like, perfect example of this not working. Um, no matter how you warp it, the edges are always going to be lines when they should be a curved arc between points. So you're going to need some additional tessellation on, on really low poly geometry. Um, but again, the good news is you don't need a lot. Uh, the 4x4 four four quad is already looking passable, and the 8x8 eight eight looks pretty good. Uh, and in fact, when we once again compare the 8x8 eight eight quad to the render texture at double res, the resulting difference image isn't that far off. Uh, and I'll note, if you're, if you're looking at a piece of geometry, that's a very large piece of geometry, like very close to your eye. Uh, so this represents kind of a worst case scenario for this technique. And as you can see again, it's doing quite well with very low tessellation. Uh, you could very easily increase the tessellation of this geometry without you know, really affecting your vertex budget. Uh, so in summary, if you decide to use this, be forewarned, you're going to have to be a little bit careful about tessellation, but you don't need to go crazy either. Um, so one of the places this is potentially problematic and a little bit irritating is on interface elements. Um, and on both these projects, we generally swapped out all the quads for 10 by 10 planes, and then we just didn't think about it again. Uh, this covered it. Uh, fortunately, text, uh, each character is rendered on a quad, and those were small enough that it, it wasn't really noticeable. Uh, if you're building interfaces in 3D space with physics, as we did in Design Lab, uh, using custom geometry for your, for your back plates uh, in your UI is really easy. Um, if you're using the existing UI systems in Unity, uh, it's still possible, but it's a little bit more involved. OK. So, so far, I've described how this works. I've talked a little bit about performance and tessellation. Uh, but I want to talk about one of the other side benefits of vertex displacement. And that's a dramatic gain in resolving power in the screen. OK, so this image is comparing vertex displacement all the way on the left to a render texture, uh, again, set through cardboard. I think it's called screen scale. Um, at one time screen resolution, all the way up to two times screen resolution, all using 4x anti-aliasing. And to my eye, the vertex displacement looks about as sharp as rendering the screen at one and a half times resolution which is a huge gain in performance, right? Anytime we can get an extra like 50% screen resolution for free, that's great. Um, so you might be wondering, like, OK, how does this work? Why, why is this the case? Uh, and this is maybe a little hard to grok, uh, but I'll, I'll try and take you through it. If you remember from before, because we're distorting the underlying geometry, all of the interpreted pixels actually get rendered. Whereas if we do this with a render texture, we have to bilinearly interpolate between screen pixels. Um, so this, in this example, uh, I wrote a quick shader, which I've, I've included most of at the bottom here, that just outputs eight pixel lines based on screen coordinates. Um, so this is a decent proxy for resolution. Thinner lines in this image represent areas of high resolution. Thick lines represent low resolution. So in the vertex displacement case, everything's even, um, because we're just rendering straight to the screen buffer. It looks like an even grid. Uh, in the render texture, you see in the center, pixels are getting blown up. 
Um, so then if we increase the resolution to 1.5, Okay, we've matched vertex displacement, but now we're, we're rendering all these extra pixels on the outer edge, and that's, that's like all completely wasted. You're not looking there. Um, so originally when we used vertex displacement, it was because of the great performance gains, uh, but the resolution enhancement was really a great side effect. Uh, and I bring it up now because on, you know, newer devices, you might not be watching performance as much, but maybe, you know, for your cardboard application, you really need an extra kick in, in uh, resolution. Okay, so I've talked enough. It's great. Uh, you want to just get started. So I have good news. This feature is fully supported in the latest Cardboard SDK for Unity, and it's really easy to set up. So on your Cardboard prefab in the scene, uh, if you select Distortion Correction, just set it to None. Turn it off. Okay, then you modify your shaders, and that's it. You're done. Uh, okay, and so many of you, you know, modifying shaders, that, that sounds like really scary. So let's... Let's just do that together very quickly. Uh, if you're writing your own vertex and fragment shaders, which if you are, that's awesome. I hope you are. Uh, it's a one-line include and a one-line change. Uh, instead of outputting the vertex position multiplied by the model view projection matrix, we include cardboard distortion and output this undistort vertex function. Uh, I, I've left the highlighting in, but I've commented out the old MVP matrix. Uh, if you're doing advanced things like shadows uh, or anything with depth, don't forget to also write a modified depth shader for any replaced shaders you're doing. Otherwise, effects won't work. And I'll come back to that later and show you an example. If, on the other hand, you're using Unity's built-in surface shaders, you just need to add a very simple vertex function and add this one line. Um, so really, there's, this is a simple thing. Just create a new surface shader, drop this in, and you're good to go. OK, so let's talk about really quickly how we did. On Design Lab, we rendered about 700,000 vertices uh, or less and under 100 draw calls. And we generally made our goal of staying near 60 on the Nexus 5. Um, that vertex count looks really high, but keep in mind that's only 350,000 per eye. Uh, and anytime you do hard normals, which we really wanted for the aesthetic, uh, it multiplies the vertex count by about six. Uh, so in a modeling program, if you looked at Design Lab, it looks like about 60,000 vertices, and you're like, wow, this is great. This is super low poly. You pull it into Unity, and you're rendering 700,000 all of a sudden. Uh, and that might come as a shock. Uh, Arctic Journey. Because we wanted to pull it back even further, we wanted to hit the S3 and the S4. And we really needed those to get, get at 60. Uh, VR experiences at 30 just aren't, aren't that compelling. Um, we brought it down to 250,000 vertices. Uh, we did that in a number of ways. Uh, a lot of it was just really old school optimization techniques, removing back faces, uh, reducing model complexity based on distance from the camera, uh, and a you know, really custom sort of stupid LOD system that as you change scenes, we just turned things off. Uh, and we just did it by hand, nothing, nothing really smart. Um, but that alone wasn't enough. Uh, the rest of the performance gains for the S3 were made by removing almost all of the textures. Uh, and moving all of the shader logic out of the pixel shader and into the vertex shader. And so that's sort of the end of part one. Uh, and this is going to seem like kind of a, a sudden transition, uh, but this is important. Um, just doing vertex displacement will get you in the ballpark. Uh, you've got a, a canvas to work on, but you still have to you know, try to find ways to optimize for these devices. Um, and that's, that's challenging. And we really want to make things look great without compromising all those performance gains we just worked so hard to, to get. Um, so now that maybe you're thinking about vertex shaders in a new way, I'm going to highlight a few fun things we did with vertex shaders uh, for other effects, and then move on to like a really quick review of our custom lighting model we created, and wrap up with a few optimization tips. So the first example, uh, the balloons from Design Lab. So this is a relatively simple shader. Um, we're writing one constant from the CPU, and that's explosion. It's written every frame. And then based on that constant, we scale all the vertices down and move them out based on the normal. And you can see once at the end, once we finished, we call that undistorted vertex function from the cardboard SDK again, and it applies the vertex displacement, and it looks great in VR. So again, a single floating point value each frame, and we can generate this whole effect. Uh, and this is actually the case where um, we're doing both uh, our own custom effect and the vertex displacement, and we have cast shadows. So there's a second depth shader as well that writes out just the modified depth, none of the color information. 
uh, in Arctic Journey, we had this ocean shader, which I'm, I'm super proud of. Uh, the position values were generated in the vertex shader sort of in a standard way, three overlapping sine functions, just you know, multi-octave noise. The tricky part's recalculating normals uh, in the vertex shader. Since vert vertices don't know about their neighbors, you can't just recalculate normals, right? So if you're in DX11, you know, maybe you're thinking like, oh, I'll just do this in a geometry shader. Uh, but run mobile, those aren't available everywhere uh, until now. Um, and anyway, they can still be expensive. So instead, we packed the whole triangle into each vertex by passing the additional verts through the normal and tangent. So you can see in that vertex input struct, there's position, normal, and tangent. But instead of using the normal and tangent for normal and tangent, we're just encoding the other two vertices. So we have all three vertices, and then we can just do a really quick calculation. Uh, because we're hard normals, this is, this is really easy. If you're doing soft normals, it, it would obviously be a little more complicated. And then this is an extension of the same idea. Uh, we needed to get that draw call count down, um, but we really wanted to have icebergs that were affected by the waves and other objects that were affected by the waves. So already we've got, you know, what, 10 icebergs in this one area, and there are hundreds in the scene. Um, that's obviously not going to work. Um, draw calls are super expensive. So to reduce them, we need to bash them together somehow. But now we need these objects to move independently of each other. Uh, you could do this by, you know, rigging up bones in Maya and then animating the bones. Um, but that's not going to respond to your procedural effect. It's involved. Uh, it, it's just not fun. Um, so instead, for each vertex, we encoded the world space X and Z object location into the UV channels. We're not using our UVs anyway. And then we use that object location per iceberg to determine the object Y offset. Uh, and then the vertices just operated normally. So really simple trick. We, we did really like stupid batching. Uh, but it saved hundreds of draw calls and allowed us to get this effect very cheaply. OK, so those are some like really basic tricks we did with the vertex shader. Uh, but now let's talk about lighting. Uh, because the major way we maintain performance on both experiences was by moving the lighting from the pixel shader to the vertex shader. Uh, because we already needed all that extra tessellation for the distortion correction, it allowed for high quality vertex lighting at the same time, and I'm going to show some of that off. Many of you, when you hear vertex lighting, you think like, oh man, like that, that old, <laughs> boy, it's like, you know, Nintendo 64 days. But when you have enough vertices uh, and you have so much available performance in the vert shader, you can really do a lot. So it's an entirely custom lighting model. Uh, I think in both of these, we used a single D light, a single directional light, um, fog, ambient. Uh, there was optionally one point light. We could have added more. We just didn't need them. Uh, in Design Lab, we wrote a custom uh, exponential shadow map solution, um, specifically so that we only had to do the shadows once. I don't think, I think Unity now has a solution for VR shadows. At the time, they didn't, so we just, we just did it. Um, Design Lab used textures for ambient occlusion and color. Arctic Journey used almost no textures whatsoever, except in a very few, uh, very few really small cases. I'll go through each of the major stages of the most common shader to render this scene. Um, first of all, this, is, this, this always comes up, but it, it happens so often. It's always worth noting that the geometry is rendered before the skybox. Uh, fill rate is your most expensive enemy on mobile. Uh, doubly so on VR, whether you're rendering to vertex displacement or the tradition even more if you're rendering to the render texture. Um, but by rendering the geometry first, the graphics card doesn't need to worry about all those black pixels that have been occluded in the skybox. Uh, the next pass was fog color. Uh, this was interpolated based on height and distance to the camera. This was all configurable. It was animated so we could do time of day transitions. Uh, fog alpha was calculated separately, same, same sort of deal there. Uh, the ambient term was specified by two colors, a sky color from directly above and a ground color from directly below. Uh, the shader interpolated between these two based on the object surface normal. Uh, standard Lambertian diffuse, N.L. Um, and this clearly suffers a bit from vertex lighting. Uh, because we used a hard normal look, we, we sort of got away with it. Um, oh, and these two foxes. So I included these two foxes because, OK, both Arctic Journey and Cardboard Design Lab used hard normals for part of the aesthetic. Um, but most games probably don't do that. You know, if you're making an application, you probably want, maybe you want soft normals. 
uh, a really smooth look. So I included a soft normals version of the Fox for all of these images, just so you can get a sense of what it looks like. Uh, and you can see that version in this image really kind of looks bad. It, it does look like the sort of like, you know, three generation old console game. Um, so depending on the project, you may want to do this one calculation in the pixel shader, uh, or just you know keep bumping the tessellation until things start to look good. Vertices are really cheap. We also added Fresnel. You know we're just going crazy now because you know this ver we can do all kinds of math in here and it's it's not really affecting performance. Uh, I'm surprised at how good this looked. And then here's all the lighting combined. Uh, lastly, we baked all of the color into the vertices themselves. We wrote a little tool in Unity uh, to read out the values from a texture so our artists could do a normal texture painting workflow. And then we just baked them into the vertices. Uh, that, that was the way we got rid of most of the, the textures. And then finally, the composite. OK, so I've talked about lighting. I've talked about vertex displacement. Um, and then I'm going to sort of wrap this up with some optimization tips, and then we'll have a good amount of time for questions. OK, so the biggest lesson we learned really was like, write your shaders. Um, when we started up a cardboard project uh, and then tried to build to really old or low power devices, we were immediately running into problems. Uh, this was increased by the, the default skybox, the Unity standard shader. These things are built for you know, achieving really great effects on high power devices, but you're probably going to need to scale things back immediately. Uh, and one of the ways you can do that is moving your, your code from the pixel shader to the vert shader, even if you need to add vertices. You know, these screens have something like 4 million pixels. Uh, so anytime you're moving to running an operation a couple hundred thousand times over four million times plus overdraw, uh, you're winning. Uh, the second note, use half precision, but be careful. Um, two to the 16th isn't that big. And one of the examples we had here, um, if you're used to writing shaders and you write half, uh, half precision doesn't exist on PC. Um, everything gets compiled to float and will run at float. So you've switched everything to half precision, great. Uh, and then you make a build and everything is broken. Uh, and the case we had here, we had rendered the sun. The sun was a pixel shader effect uh, based on the dot product of like uh, a vector direction and then a scalar value for how big it was. Uh, and at some point, someone decided they wanted to make the skybox bigger uh, so that we could see a, a further draw distance. After we did that, um, I started getting bug reports uh, from, from people testing on devices that the sun was huge. Uh, and, and I'm trying to figure this out. The sun's huge. I, you know, classic engineer thing. I said, no, no, it's not. It's, it's fine. Uh, nothing's wrong. And I got a device. And in fact, the sun was taking up the entire sky. And what had happened was someone had scaled the, uh, the skybox from 200 meters to 300 meters. And I, I'm sitting there scratching my head. So 200, and I looked in there, and they were all halves. So 256 squared, uh, we were doing a length calculation that that number was exploding, uh, and the sun blew up. Uh, lastly, get clever with your vertex data and uniforms. Uh, you can pack a lot of data into your vertices from the CPU, and you can do that once. Um, things like batching uh, or you know, packing other vertices in and calculating your normals. Um, moving data, anytime you can move it from either you know, per vertex operations on the CPU to the GPU or per pixel operations back to the vertex shader, you're winning. Textures. Uh, watch out for large, uncompressed, or non-mipmap textures. Uh, one of the biggest problems we had on Design Lab was there was a, like a really small, uncompressed texture that didn't have mipmaps hiding out on one object. Uh, and anytime you looked in one direction, the performance would drop, and we couldn't figure it out. You know, there was the vertex count wasn't going up, the memory wasn't really increasing. Finally, we found this texture uh, and flipped the flipped the mip maps on, and everything was fine. Uh, and what's happening is, uh, especially on some of the older devices, the cache isn't very large, and you're blowing through your texture cache. Uh, so those things can really uh, seem insurmountable uh, and really confusing. Um, but if you know what to look out for, uh, it, it's not too bad. Um, again, on Arctic Journey, we just we, we approach this by removing all of the textures. It's obviously an easy solution. 
Um, avoid hidden dependent texture reads. Uh, Nathan Martz actually mentioned this to me, something I'd forgotten. Um, anytime you are calculating your UV coordinates in the pixel shader, it's a dependent texture read and it goes through a slow path. Uh, and, and what he reminded me of was that even swizzle operators uh, count as dependent texture reads. So if you've passed four UV coordinates from your vertex shader into your pixel shader, and you're like, great, I can read into two textures, this one dot xy, this one dot zw, those are dependent texture reads on uh, OpenGL ES. Uh, and then pack your channels. Um, you know, don't just upload an alpha channel, upload a full RGBA and, and use all of your channels. Or, or maybe you can bake the whole texture to vertices like we did. Uh, okay, optimization. Um, a lot of people asked us, you know, how did you optimize? What's the most important? Uh, and the, the answer I always give, you know, first you really need to profile. Uh, and this can be challenging. Um, it's often very hard to figure out what, what, your, what your limiting factor is. Um, so we had a lot of really simple test scenes. Uh, for fill rate, we'd usually replace all of the shaders with a solid color shader. Uh, that was the easiest way to tell if we were burning fill. Um, make sure things like the Unity skybox are turned off if you're doing these tests. Um, other, other examples, uh, just removing all the objects and rendering a cube. That was actually how we discovered that the render texture was the, the problem to begin with. Um, the first test we did on the S3 that really showed us we had a problem was just a simple cube in a room. Uh, second, uh, it's probably draw calls. Um, <laughs> Eliminating draw calls, either by batching objects together or removing them, is always good. Uh, third, minimizing textures, either by reducing them in size, uh, removing them altogether, enabling map maps, turning on compression. Uh, fourth, simplify your fragment shaders if you can. Uh, pull data into vertex shaders. Uh, and lastly, um, reducing your vertex count. Um, I say lastly because most of the optimizations we've been doing before have been increasing vertex complexity, and you may have needed to increase vertex count, and typically those are more important. Obviously, if you're running you know, 10 million vertices, that, that balance shifts a little bit. Uh, sorry. Oh, right, some resources. Um, the Cardboard SDK for Unity, of course, uh, which is a great place to start. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, Cardboard Design Lab is open source. Uh, so definitely go grab that. You can check out a lot of this stuff there. Um, and then one final link, uh, the OpenGL ES optimization tips. It goes into a lot more de detail of some of the things I've mentioned here, uh, especially like some of the weirdness with swizzling textures, um, other things you might run into. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, and then questions. What about uh, chromatic aberration correction using this technique? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, no, uh, we, d we did not do any. Um, fortunately, the, the lenses on cardboard don't seem to exhibit a whole lot of chromatic aberration. But yeah, if you're on a headset that does, you're, you're shot. Um, that's, that's a great case for using a, a render texture. And the second question, uh, how does this uh, technique relate to Daydream? Right. So this is not supported on Daydream because Daydream um, is using a render texture for uh, a few effects, um, some electronic stabilization, uh, and a few others. Uh, I, I just found out about Daydream today. So um, those guys are on the, uh, what's the, what's the channel? Sorry. The space. Right, the space. So if you ask them, they can give you more detail. Thank you. Yep. Uh, the implementation about the distortion, uh, is it open source? So we can take a look at how it was done. Yeah. Uh, so all of the CG ink, the cardboard, is included. Uh, it's just using a, a brown Conradi, like, you know, expansion of terms. So, you know, squared, fourth. Um, but it's all in there, so you can see it. I didn't include it just because it, it started to get a little bit math heavy and, and like, a lot of code. Um, but it's all in there, so check it out. OK, thanks. Yep. I think that was my same question. The source code is available uh, through the, the GitHub repo that you Yeah. Do you want me to 
I can click it back. Yeah, it's a Unity sample, Unity tree. Yeah, if you check out the Cardboard Design Lab source, it's in there. And the second question, um, do you do a brute force render for the left and the right eye, or do you optimize by uh, material shape? Ah, uh, yeah. So one of the things I was thinking about doing was like, what if we what if we packed all the data into what if we packed like the left and right vertices into a single object and then and then you know passed in two two matrices? Uh, we didn't get there because uh, there were some other problems with like clipping and culling and stuff. Uh, I just didn't have time really. But yes, there, I, I think that's possible. Yeah. Anyone else? Anyone? Cool.